All right, so we're going to do the second half of Chapter 3 now. Uh, we're going to pick up on page 23 where we left off. Um, we left off talking about net listings, so we're going to pick up here on page 23, um, the other brokers section. So with the other brokers section, um, a lot of this talks about things that could be construed as violations of this act called the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the Sherman Antitrust Act is an act that was put into place to prevent any non-competitive or anti-competitive business practices. So we'll talk about some things that could be uh, examples of that. So the first one here um, would be an illegal thing called price fixing. And what price fixing would be, if two brokers were to get together, and let's say they're big competitors in town, and they say, listen, we're the two top dogs in town, nobody else is really competing with us, but every owner is starting to call both of us out to their house and interview both of us, and they're listing with whichever one of us will offer the lowest rate of commission. So why don't we both agree right now that neither of us will charge less than 6% commission, so we both make more money, but we'll probably still get the same amount of listings. How does that sound? And they shake hands behind closed doors and agree to that. That's illegal. That's called price fixing, um, which is competitors conspiring to fix the price of a certain good or service, in this case, real estate commissions. Um, Next year, talked about broker cooperation. So in New Jersey, every time that you take a listing, you are obligated by law to cooperate with all the brokers. That means if I list 123 Main Street and an agent from, let's say, ABC Realty, um, who happens to be my biggest competitor in town, wants to show it, I can't say, no, you can't show it. I have to cooperate with all brokers and allow all brokers to show my listing, unless I have my client sign this document called a waiver broker cooperation. Um, this document, the waiver broker cooperation, is a seller basically saying that I want just a listing firm and just a listing firm only to show my home and to sell my home. Um, by doing so, they're basically allowing you to just, you know, that, that's the, if you ever heard the phrase, a pocket listing, um, that's like a pocket listing. Some people might, as a slang term, call it an office exclusive, things like that. <clears throat> that's what that is. Um, so again, if you wanted to list your home to the exclusion of all brokerage firms, except for the listing brokerage, the document you would sign is called a waiver broker cooperation. Um, and next year, discriminatory commission splits. Now, when it talks about discriminatory commission splits, it's probably not the discrimination that you're thinking of. This would not be discrimination based on things like race, creed, color, sex, national origin, um, but rather discriminatory commission splits here would be like, let's say I did a deal last month and I brought a buyer to John Smith's listing. And he was only paying out, let's say, you know, 2% to buyer's brokers. And then I go off a month later, I take, let's say, a 6% listing, and I'm paying out 3% to buyer's brokers. And he brings me a buyer. And I say, John, I know it says I'm offering 3%, but for you it's 2% because you just paid me out 2% on 123 Main Street. You can't do that. That's illegal. The commission offering that you make to one agent, you're making to all agents. So when you sign a listing agreement, you're also signing not only the commission you're charging the seller, for the commission that you will be offering prospective buyer's agents. So whether that buyer's agent is your best friend or your worst enemy, it's the same for everybody. That's what they mean by you can't have discriminatory commission splits. Um, and then next year, commissions to non-resident brokers. Um, you could pay a commission to any broker in the entire country by way of a referral fee. But technically, the referral is done between broker to broker. The referral is not done between salesperson to salesperson. So, if they were to ever ask you about referral fees, like if you have a client moving to California, can you refer them to an agent out there? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, you'd put a referral uh, agreement in place, and um, just in general, as far as referrals are concerned, technically they're paid between broker to broker. You as a salesperson might set it up, but it ultimately it's your broker who signs off on it. So uh, referral fees can be paid between any broker in the entire country. You don't have to be a referral agent to collect a referral fee. Uh, salesperson's compensation, we talked about this in the first half. The only person you can accept commission from is just your employing broker. Then on the right side here at page 23, advertising. So in regards to advertising, every single ad that you place must have the name of your brokerage firm. So every ad you place would have to have the name of your brokerage firm. And if that ad did not have the name of your brokerage firm, we call it a blind ad, and blind ads are illegal. Second, almost every ad you place also must have at least the name of the town the property is located in. With the one exception being, if you advertise in a newspaper, and the section here is like the Maywood section, you don't have to write in your ad down here that the home's in Maywood. It's already assumed it's in Maywood because it's under the town heading. But no matter what, every ad that you place must have the name of your brokerage firm. 
and also every ad that you place, your personal information cannot be in more prominent print in the brokerage firm's information. So uh, like my name can't be this big and the brokerage firm's this big. So in general, any ad that I place, my information cannot be in larger print than the brokerage firm's information. And really anything I put about myself, I have to put about the brokerage firm as well. So I put uh, my phone number would have to have the brokerage firm's phone number. Um, if I happen to have my own personal website, somewhere on my personal website, it must either A, electronic link to the broker's website, a brokerage, I should say the brokerage's website, um, or B, list of brokerage's contact info somewhere on there. So, and advertising is not just, uh, you know, paper, not just TV, it would include things like social media too. So if they were to ask about social media advertising, do the same regulations apply? They do. Same regulations apply whether it be social media, whether it be just general online advertising, newspaper, phone call, flyers, things like that. All those are forms of advertising. Let's turn and go to page 24. Um, page 24 here talks about a CMA, a comparative market analysis. So this is one of the rare few things you can offer for free to prospective clients. A free CMA, a free comparative market analysis, is basically us giving somebody a free valuation of what their home is worth. Um, you can give a free CMA, but you cannot give a free CMA if it's contingent upon that person signing a contract with you. So again, you can have free offerings up to $5. You can offer free CMAs, but you may never have any sort of free offerings um, that are contingent upon somebody signing a contract with you. Um, let's see, on the right side here of 24, Top right talks about words like under contract and sold. So when can you advertise the word under contract? What does that mean? Well, under contract means you exit an attorney review and your prior and it's prior to closing. So the period of time after attorney review concludes, but prior to closing, we define that as under contract. After you accept an offer, the deal's still not even binding yet. Because in a sales contract, after you accept an offer with all sales contracts and leases for a year or more, you have an attorney review period. So in that circumstance, after attorney review concludes but prior to closing, that we call under contract. You can't use the word sale pending. Sale pending actually is not supposed to be used. You would use the term under contract. And you can't use sold until the property is actually sold, which means the deed has changed hands, you know, ownership is, is going through, the closing has happened, things like that. Um, the reason I say that, and you know, on the test, you know, they want to make sure you know that, is because maybe you had a client accept an offer today, and you're going around telling people, hey, I just sold that house today. We didn't sell it yet. Frankly, it's not even under contract yet. Um, sold does not occur until the closing takes place and the deed changes hands. And then on the right side here at 24, talk about some words you can use to describe salespersons, brokers, broker salespersons, things like that. So a salesperson, um, if they want it to, you know, on their business card, they can use words like salesperson, sales associate or realtor associate where permitted if they're a member of the National Association of Realtors. Um, because just so you guys know, the term realtor is used to describe somebody who's a member of the National Association of Realtors. So you can really only use the term realtor if you're actually a member of the National Association of Realtors. Um, talked about websites already. Uh, go to page 25. Franchisee and trade name advertising. If you work for a franchise company, you just have to disclose that each office is independently owned and operated. So this way you're not implying common ownership. So the disclosure that you would have to make if you work for a franchise company in advertising is that each office independently owned and operated. You wouldn't have to do this on like classified ads or for sale signs, things like that. But if I put out a flyer for a listing that I have and I have my company name and I work for a franchise company, I would just have to have some kind of disclosure that each office is independently owned and operated. Then the right side here at 25 talks about trust and escrow accounts. So why do we have trust and escrow accounts? And do we have them as salespersons? No, we don't. Your brokerage firm has those. So, and the whole purpose of having these trust accounts is to make sure that you're not mixing personal and business funds. Um, if you were to mix personal and business funds, we call that commingling, and commingling is illegal. Um, so commingling, again, is a mixing of personal and business funds, and that is illegal. That is not allowed. So. In regards to these trust and escrow accounts, um, the Real Estate Commission has regulations on these. One is that they must be located in New Jersey. Two is that they must be located not only in New Jersey, but Real Estate Commission approved depository institutions, which means Real Estate Commission approved banks. Because as we said in the first part of Chapter 3, if the Real Estate Commission wants to launch an investigation, how many days notice do they have to give you? The answer is zero. 
part of doing an investigation might be to search your your trust account. So they need to have access to those freely. So these trust accounts must be located in New Jersey at real estate commission approved banks. And if your client ever gives you, gives you deposit money to be deposited into that trust account, can you as a salesperson do that? No, your broker would have to do that. Um, so again, it's not like a salesperson's trust account. Your broker deposits the money. Um, so basically, we just give the check over to the broker, and the broker must deposit that. And if they were to ask you how soon must clients' money be deposited, the answer is five business days. So again, all clients' money would have to be deposited within five business days. All right, so let's turn and go to page 26. Um, on 26 here, it talks about earnest money deposits. So in regards to an earnest money deposit, they can also call it a good faith deposit. And if you guys are familiar with buying a home, you might have heard of sometimes people writing a check along with their offer, maybe a $1,000 check. Well, that $1,000 check they write along with their offer, we call either an earnest money or a good faith deposit check. So again, the earnest money or good faith deposit check is a check written along with an offer. The first thing to really know about it, besides the definition that we just went over, is that it's not required. You're not required to have this earnest money or good faith deposit check. It is completely and totally optional. But let's say that your client does do it. They write it out to your brokerage firm. How soon must that be deposited? The answer would be within five business days, number one. And also, for this um, earnest money and good faith deposit check, despite the fact that it's not required, it still does certainly happen. And again, if they write that check out, that earnest money good faith deposit check, they would have to write it out either the broker term or the attorneys. They would not be writing it out to me, the salesperson. And the earnest money good faith deposit check by itself is not said to be consideration. The consideration to buy the home is the total purchase price. So this can apply towards the total consideration, sure it does. But by itself, this is not said to be consideration. So if they were to ask you, like, which of the following is not said to be consideration, this. Again, it gets applied towards consideration, but by itself, it's not consideration. Um, and obviously, as you guys would probably assume, if your offer is not accepted, what happens to this check? It would get returned right back to your possession. So if I write an offer of 500 and the owner does not accept it, and you know, I would just get that check right back. So again, if the offer is not accepted, earnest money is returned right back to the uh, right back to the buyer. All right, and then on 27 towards the bottom left, talk about other licensee responsibilities. Um, duplicate originals for one. So anytime you have your client sign something, you have to give them a copy of that. So if I go to take a listing and I have my client sign seven different documents, I have to give them a copy of all of those for their own personal records. And that just means duplicate originals. So anytime you have your client sign something, you go over something with them, give them a copy of it. Obligation to learn pertinent facts about the home. You're obligated as a licensee to learn the pertinent facts about the home. Because these are things that could make your client decide whether or not they'd like to buy or not buy the home. So you have an obligation to learn these pertinent facts. The easiest way to do that, if you're the listing agent, is to have your client fill out a seller's disclosure form. This seller's disclosure form, what it basically is, is a series of yes, no questions and dates. And it's basically the seller telling you everything that they happen to know about their home. So that's what you would find in the, uh, in the seller's disclosure form. One of the important things to note about that seller's disclosure form is that it's not required. They don't have to fill it out. I highly encourage you to have your clients fill it out because it kind of, you know, covers your, your you know, ass a little bit um, in regards to, uh, you know, if anything were to pop up as far as, uh, as far as like misrepresentation because, you know, we can only do so much, you know, because the uh, owner might have lived there for the past 20 years. I didn't live there with them for the past 20 years. So you know, I got to rely on their representations for a lot of things. Uh, top right here at page 27, uh, talk about things like absolute fidelity to your principal. In other words, be loyal to your client's interest. So if your client tells you, hey, listen, I'm listed at 700, but I would accept 675, at an open house and a buyer comes through, you're not going to pull them aside and say, hey, just so you know, I know it says 700, but they would accept 675. You know, don't do that. That would be ruining, you know, your relationship with your client. Um, you're going behind their back, you know, being disloyal to them, and obviously, you know, just um, going against your absolute fidelity to your principal. And then next here on the top right of 27, submit all written offers immediately. Only written offers. All written offers must be submitted within 24 hours. Verbal offers, you don't even have to tell your clients about. But all written offers must be submitted within 24 hours. So if they were to ask you um, how soon must written offers be submitted, all written offers must be submitted to clients within 24 hours. 
Also talks here about recommend legal counsel and appropriate. So if your client asks you a question that borders on a legality issue, you should not answer that question. You should tell them, hey, listen, that's a legal question. Please consult your attorney. Likewise, if a situation arises and you don't know what to do, who should you consult with the licensee? You should consult your brokerage firm, consult your broker in particular. So um, again, if, if you don't know what to do in a certain situation, when in doubt, you know, one of the answers might be consult your broker. If it's a legal thing and your client asks you a legal question, your advice to them should be, consult an attorney in that case. Um, next year, talk about to provide the Attorney General's Memorandum. So what is the Attorney General's Memorandum? So what it does, it outlines the law against discrimination. So every time you take a listing, you would have to give a copy of this to your seller. And it basically tells them that when selling your home, you cannot discriminate when, when picking a buyer. So in general, for the um, Attorney General's Memorandum, it basically simply just states that when selling your home, um, you cannot discriminate when choosing your buyer. And the bottom right here at 27 talks about you know, transaction records. Certain records are kept for six years, others for six months. Six years, completed transactions, how clients' money was handled. Six months, unaccepted offers and expired listings. So they ask you about record keeping. They'll ask you about either the six years thing we just spoke about or the six months. All right, so let's go to page 28. And 28 talks about attorney review here. So really talks about attorney review for the next, uh, next you know, section here in general. But for the attorney review, um, they might ask you where does this apply? The attorney review applies to all sales contracts and leases for a year or more. So number one, the attorney review applies to all sales contracts and leases for a year or more. Number two, we say it's a mandatory three business day period. So in regard to the mandatory three business day period, the attorney review could hypothetically be one day. It could also be extended to any period of time that this, you know, the two attorneys want to. The reason why we say it's a mandatory three business day period, though, is because if the buyer and seller don't consult an attorney, three business days must go by before that deal becomes legally binding. Um, in other words, they must be given a three business day window to consult an attorney if they do choose to do so. So in general, number one, it applies to all sales contracts and leases for a year or more. And number two for the attorney review, um, you know, mandatory three business day period. Now number three for the attorney review, while you're in attorney review, the buyer seller may back out with absolutely zero liability. So if they were to ask you with the attorney review, um, you know, how does that affect the buyer and seller? During the attorney review period, the buyer seller may back out and there would be absolutely zero liability at that point in time. So that's a couple things on the attorney review there. Um, any offers that you receive after attorney review, what do we call those? We call those backup offers. Um, so like, let's say we exit attorney review and we're three weeks away from closing, a good offer comes in, your client wants to accept it. Well, number one, they should consult their attorney. But number two, why is it treated as a backup offer? It's treated as a backup offer. We can't accept it at that point in time because if we were to accept that, we'd have to breach our first deal. And then we could be sued for things like compensatory damages, one of which might be difference in, in sales price, uh, difference in market value, things like that. So again, any, any offers received after attorney review are called backup offers. Um, and then next here on 28, talk about grounds for suspension or revocation of your license. You guys can read through those examples in the book, but I'll just explain to you what suspension or revocation is. If your license is suspended, it's for a portion of the remaining license term. So our license term is from July 1st, odd-numbered year, to July 1st, odd-numbered year. So um, let's say today was, uh, was February 1st, 2019, hypothetically. Um, if my license were suspended today, it's suspended for a period of time less than up to July 1, 2019. If my license were revoked today, it's revoked until at least July 1, 2019. So suspension is a portion of remaining license term, revocation for the entire remaining license. And again, you'll see numbers 1 through 16 that are going through some examples. Um, page 29 on the right side here talks about the fine. So if you were to violate the real estate license laws, how much can you be fined? Now, the Real Estate Commission doesn't have to fine you. If you're doing something wrong, they might either put you on probation, um, they perhaps may just issue you a cease and desist order saying, hey, you're doing this, stop doing this, you might not even know what's wrong, but please stop doing this, or they can issue you fines on top of suspending or revoking your license. Now the fines are listed on the right side here of page 29. For a first violation, you'd be fined up to $5,000. For a second, up to $10,000. For a third, up to $10,000. So if you were to commit like three at once, it could be a maximum of $25,000 total. 
three strikes you're out. You commit three, you're, you're going to lose your license. So in general, for the fines, for the first violation, it's a 5,000, second up to 10, third up to 10, for a grand total maximum of 25,000 total. That's on the right side here on page 29. And if you turn and go to page 30, on the bottom left, it talks about automatic suspension of the, uh, of the salesperson's license. So I talked about this a little bit in part one. When would the salesperson's license get automatically suspended? It would be automatically suspended if there's no broker in place. It doesn't matter why there's no broker in place, whether it be death, incapacitation, they quit, they, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, if there's no broker in place, all salesperson's licenses are automatically suspended. They'll be reactivated when there's a new broker put into place. But again, for the time being, they would be automatically suspended. So automatic susp suspension would be if there's no broker in place. Top right here of page 30 would be a license law violation called block busting, which is also discriminatory as well. So you could be in some hot water with the uh, like things like Division of Civil Rights, who covers the New Jersey anti-discrimination laws. So um, with, uh, with block busting here, if they were to ask you uh, which of the following best describes um, a discriminatory solicitation practice where a broker makes representations that due to the entry into your neighborhood, a minority group or group's values are really going to sink, so you might want to sell now, and what's that called? That's called blockbusting. Blockbusting is illegal. It's not allowed. They might try to trick you on the test and say something like, you've gone door to door and you've told uh, people in that neighborhood that they're considering knocking down the woods behind their house and, uh, and building... Um, uh, new highway, this would be an example of. Well, I can tell you the answer is not blockbusting. Uh, blockbusting is, is discriminatory. By you going door to door and telling people, hey, they might knock down your woods and build a highway, that's not discriminatory in any way, shape, or form. Discriminatory would be saying they might knock down the woods behind your house and move a lot of minorities in there, and that's going to hurt your value. That's discriminatory. That's blockbusting. Um, and then if you go to page 31, Talk about the Real Estate Sales Full Disclosure Act. So what this act does, it regulates the sales and marketing of out-of-state properties in New Jersey. So if you're a developer from out-of-state and you're building like a brand new, let's say, retirement community down in Florida, and you want to market these units in New Jersey, you're allowed to, but you'd have to file that offering with the state if you're offering 100 lots or more. So number one, this act regulates the sales and marketing of out-of-state properties in New Jersey. Number two, it would only apply to you for like a bulk offering, 100 lots or more. Um, number three, you'd also have to file with the state this thing called a public offering statement, which is basically making a blanket uniform offer to everybody. And the purpose of that would be that they want to make sure there's no discrimination going on. They want to make sure that, you know, you didn't just build this retirement community in Florida for people of a certain race, color, sex, religion, or national origin. So this way you're making the same blanket public offer to everybody. So number three there, you have to have that public offering statement. Now, if you don't have that public offering statement and you don't file with the state, the fines could be quite hefty. They could fine you up to $50,000 per violation. So again, they could fine you up to $50,000 per violation. So the fines are pretty hefty here. Um, and also, if let's say you sign a contract to buy one of these places, you as a buyer have seven days to change your mind. There's a seven calendar day cooling off for rescission period. So again, seven calendar day pulling off rescission period where you have to, you know, basically a, a week to change your mind, essentially. Um, so those are the main things for the Real Estate Sales Full Disclosure Act there, the main things to take away. Um, that does it for the book material on Chapter 3. As you guys know, at the end of every single chapter, we have some practice questions. We have about 50 for this chapter, so go ahead, go on to those practice questions and, you know, for, for practice. Um, again, this is just a very, very sped up, you know, quick recap of this chapter. Uh, when we go over this in class, we spend like 12 hours on this. Um, part one and two here combined equals about an hour. So this is just to you know dump the material on you, so you guys get a good grasp for uh, the type of you know material uh, that is in chapter three and things you could perhaps be tested on. So as always, if you guys have any questions, you know definitely feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is simple. It's my name. It's kylekovetz at gmail.com. Talk to you guys soon.